He has over, what, 36 years uh, sport broadcasting career in several different areas, which has seen him provide commentary for some of Jamaica's and the region's most iconic track and field moments in the Olympics and World Championships, and also many other sporting events, including horse racing. In this episode, we speak with legendary sport journalist and broadcaster, Lance Whitaker. Lance is the vice president of production and executive producer at Sports Max TV. Lance, welcome. Thank you very much, Dalton. Great to be here. Yeah, I appreciate it. Listen, it was just the other day you celebrated 36 years in this industry. How yes. has that been? Well, very rewarding, I'd have to say. It was like, it's been like a dream job for me. So um, from the very first day I started back in June 1984 at Radio Jamaica, I saw that as an achievement and sort of arriving to a point that, you know, I, I had longed for, you know, to, for an opportunity to, to delve into something that I had long felt was something like a bit of a calling, I have to say, because friends from my school days would, would tell me or remind me quite often when they see me now that, you know, Lance, you, you were destined to do this because they remember me impersonating commentators and improvising commentary of cricket, football, horse racing in between classes at Woolmers. So it's like it was a, a dream job for me and I've enjoyed every minute of it, to be quite honest. Listen, Lance, that was things transition in, in, in your uh, mind in terms of the, the industry. What are some of the changes that you have seen? Well, significant changes. When I started at Radio Jamaica in 1984, we had no computers. <laughs> we, used that, we used a typewriter to type scripts to, to read on air. So from, from the very uh, beginning uh, to now, we have had significant transformation in, in media and how we operate and how we, we get news there. As you said, I said, there's no computers. So there was no internet at the time. So your, your, research, your research process was completely different now than it was then. It was the telephone. It was you know, reading a lot of historical data and um, not information at your fingertips in the way that it is now when you Google and you go to Wiki and you go to your various sports websites to you know to have the the history of the events you had mm. to you know i remember when i covered my first olympic games in barcelona in 1992 i had to like, purchase a book on the history of the olympic games which gave me all of the information on you know the history of the olympic games which i had known a lot of before because as a student of sport i would have monitored it but you know today you you go on uh, the olympics website and you click on you know, the various Olympic Games, and there's your information laid out right in front of you on your computer. So in those days, I was just radio at the time, because at that time, Radio Jamaica had not yet purchased Jamaica Broadcasting Corporation, which has now become TVJ. So I, I started out purely as a radio journalist, and um, I read radio sports, and I did commentary on football, cricket, track and field, boxing, and so on. But when I take my mind back to 1984, and think of what I did on a daily basis and thought of my, you know, functionally what I did from getting into office to leave, leaving the, the office, the work pattern and the work landscape was nothing like it is now. Mm -hmm. Mainly, as I said, because of, of the internet and the computers, which we now have to make our work a lot, make our job a lot easier. Yeah, that, that 98 Olympics in Barcelona was, was an important one for, for several of our athletes, in, including Juliet. Uh, you have covered, and Juliet Cuthbert now, uh, you have yes. covered many different Olympic Games. Uh, talk me through some of the, I guess, the good and bad in terms of trying to do those commentaries. Mm. Uh, well, first of all, my first Olympic Games would have been 1992 in Barcelona. I, that, I covered those games for Radio Jamaica because I was at Radio Jamaica at the time. The next Olympics I went to was the 1996 Atlanta Olympics, which I had covered as part of a, a Caribbean news agency That's team right. with the Caribbean Broadcasting Union because by then I had moved to Barbados and I was working with Kana, the Caribbean news agency. So the Atlanta Olympics was, was sort of radio for me along with doing print stories because I was writing for the Caribbean news agencies um, news agencies uh, 
news print presentation. So I had a lot of work to do with print and not just radio. Now, 2000, Sydney was when I started doing more television. So that's when the television aspect of my job came in. And then the same for Athens 2004, Beijing 2008, and then the um, London Olympics in 2012. I didn't go to the 2016 Rio Olympics. It was the first Olympics since 1992 that I had not been to. But many, many highs for my, my experience with covering the Olympic Games. A few lows, but you know some of the highs would have been for sure 1996 when Dion Hemmings won the 400 hurdles, so defeating uh, Kim Batten and Tonya Buford, um, upsetting the two Americans. She finished first, the Americans second and third. And um, that was a glorious moment for us. It was the first time in the history of the Olympic Games that an English-speaking Caribbean woman would have been winning an Olympic gold medal. So that was tremendous for me. Of course, um, 2000 was also fairly big. We had a lot of silver medals for the Caribbean. As I said, by then I was now covering for the Caribbean and not necessarily for Jamaica. So Atta Bolden with the silver in the 100, Obadele Thompson, the Barbadian with bronze in the 100. Um, Lorraine Fenton, I think, got a medal in the 400 yeah. as well. And then everything exploded after that. 2004, Veronica Campbell-Brown at the sprint relay team. We don't have to talk about Beijing 2008 <laughs> with Shelly and Usain Bolt and Melaine Walker, BCB and so on. And then 2012, Bolt and um, Shelly and again taking the spotlight. Uh, so those were some of the big moments for me as far as success for the region is concerned. But if you talk about like low points, um, I would say Barcelona had a, had a few low points personally for me because it was my first Olympic Games and I actually suffered from uh, a, 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 some stolen property while I was in the, 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 um, the journalist's room at the International Broadcast Center. Uh, someone stole my, my pouch, which had all my, my uh, at those times, traveler's checks is what we used to use then. <laughs> traveler's checks and, you know, a watch and uh, my, my tape recorder and so on. So I look back at 92 with a, a, a little bit of disappointment for that because it threw me off. It was my first major assignment as a, as a journalist. And that was a little bit difficult to deal with. Um, I, I got the pouch back. I think the day after, but some things were missing and so on. Another low point for me would have been the Sydney Olympics 2000 when the Jamaican team or a huge part of the Jamaican team had a demonstration against Merle Nottie's selection to the team. And I must say, Dalton, that was one of the lowest moments in my career as a journalist because um, it, it was an embarrassing experience as a Jamaican and because of Merle Nottie's status as a Jamaican sprinter to see her own teammates bearing placards um, demonstrating against her inclusion in the team. It was covered extensively by the BBC, the ESPN and so on. So we were on the global stage in a negative sense then. So, and, and you know, at that time, Merle Naughty was our biggest star. And um, I know there was, it was triggered by the fact that uh, Peter Gay Dowdy had won the trials, national trials yeah. the national trials, and they were shifting her off the team to put Merlin on. But the issue was apparently she had an injury that, that she wasn't being completely honest about. But there were many um, team members. I remember Gregory Houghton, the 400 meter runner, leading the way with the demonstration. So that was, that was very disappointing. So those were some of the low points for me, but the high points far outweigh the, the, the low ones for sure. Yeah, I, I haven't traveled as much as you have, but certainly I, one of the things when you travel with these, with the teams, as a Jamaican, you would be one of the go-to persons that international media would be trying to get some information from. <laughs> You've hit the nail on the head, Dalton, because <laughs> myself, myself and Hubert Lawrence, I'm sure you know him well, because yeah. Hubert is, is a, a real tremendous talent as far as his encyclopedic knowledge of track and field is concerned. And usually when we are there, because I've covered like, five of my six Olympic Games with Hubert by my side, or, or at least four of them. Mm -hmm. And um, we are in demand when we go to these events, especially since the advent of a Usain Bolt in 2008 mm -hmm. Beijing. You know, they see you with a Jamaica t-shirt or they recognize that you're, you're from Jamaica and immediately the cameras come out, 
the microphones come out and they want to interview you about Jamaica and yeah. the fact that the country is so prolific with producing stars. So you're bombarded with questions about Jamaica and why is the track and field program so successful? And we are almost as sought after by the international press as, as the athletes themselves are. So um, <laughs> as journalists from Jamaica, we become stars at, at the Olympic Games, whichever, whichever games we go to. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, I did talk to Hubert. Uh, and he's a huge fan of yours. He thinks that you're, you're one of the best in the entire Caribbean. How, how easy or difficult has it been working with Hubert and, and talk to me about his personality and that synergy between you two? Yeah, well, it's seamless really because Hubert is a wonderful individual. He is... A, he has a tremendous track and field brain. His, his, his ability to, to re, reconnect with things of the past and statistics and so on, I, I would say they, they are, they, the sky's the limit for him. He has no, there, there are no bounds to the, the level of, of um, memory and, and, and recall of statistical mm -hmm. information in his brain. And apart from that, he is a, a wonderful individual. So working with him, the first time we worked together was Sydney 2000. We we're actually roommates for the Sydney Olympic Games. And he's such an easygoing person, um, calm, uh, very, very humble. And uh, we developed the kind of synergy that we just, we just were able to bounce off each other when we were on air working. We would, we would never ever cross each other. He almost knows exactly when I'm going to come to a, a, a full stop as opposed to a comma in my, in my delivery. And uh, there is a little crossing over. And because statistically he's so strong as a combination, because people talk about my excitement when I'm bringing commentary on the sort of, um, the sort of capture of the big moments that that was my strong point. And then with Hubert compliment, complimenting, with the information and the statistics and the historical data and the profile information of all the athletes, you know, it just worked as a good combination. And I developed a good synergy with Hubert when I was on air. And um, one of the great things about Hubert Lawrence is that he, he isn't only strong with Jamaican and Caribbean athletes, you know, he, he knows all of the athletes around the world. There'll be a, a shot put thrower from Croatia and he launches into his background and what high school he went to and, <laughs> and has everyone stupefied. No, Hubert is brilliant. Hubert is, is the best in the world. Yeah, I've said yeah. that to him and he doesn't like to hear it because he's a humble person. He doesn't like the attention. But as far as his knowledge of track and field is concerned from a standpoint of information on athletes and so on, there's no one I've met that I would put ahead of him. So it was easy to work with. Hubert, and I always look forward to any commentary assignment that I have with Hubert by my side. Let, let me just ask you this one. We, you know, we know about the, the Reds Pereira, Donna Simmons, etc. in cricket. Yourself and Hubert stand above the rest in, in terms of not just track and field, but sport in general in the Caribbean and worldwide. How do you do it? And how do you prepare you know, for each event to make it seem so easy? Well, a lot of people who have done both radio and television will tell you that radio is really an excellent place to start. Because when you're doing radio commentary, you are fully aware that your listeners can't see what you're seeing. So your ability to describe the action and your ability to transfer the excitement that you're seeing in front of your eyes to the listener on radio is something that generates a lot of excitement in you personally mm -hmm. and, and I get an adrenaline rush out of knowing that when I'm on radio which is where I started as we said it is my duty to capture the excitement that I'm seeing to the listener on radio who doesn't who, who doesn't have the ability who doesn't have the facility to see what I am seeing so radio is something that prepared you for capturing the excitement of a commentary moment in pretty much the same way that a Red Spirit and a Tony Cozier would have done on the cricket fields. These are commentators I grew up listening to and, and like to pattern myself off them. 
uh, my greatest mentor, though, if, if I may say so, would have been a ho horse racing commentator by the name of Chris Armand when I was growing up. He's now a racing administrator, but when I was growing up in my teens, Chris Armand was the main commentator at Cayman Spark, and I was just so in awe of his ability in bringing the excitement of uh, the horse racing to me as a radio, radio listener. I would say that part of my success has had a lot to do with passion for what I'm doing. So when I was in school, as I said, I did commentary and so on just as a hobby. It wasn't, it wasn't, I never ever saw while I was in school the media and broadcasting as a, as a profession. I, I, I will admit that it was the furthest thing from my mind. But when I left Woolmers and then, you know, you're looking into your adult years and you start to decide what you want to do professionally, it hit me that I could make a career out of media because of how easy it was for me. And I've always heard the saying that if you really, really love what you do professionally, you will never work a day in your life because it doesn't feel like work. So a lot of what I, a lot of what I was able to achieve as a young broadcaster, I think, came as a result of my passion for the field of sports commentary and radio based on what I felt while I was in school. When I was at school, I listened to the radio a lot. And I love music, Dalton. I would, I would tell you that I love music a lot. And although I've become a sports commentator, I think I would just as quickly have become a disc jockey or a continuity announcer on radio because of my love for music. I'm, I'm not sure if in my heart I love sport any more than I love music. In fact, there was a period when I was at Radio Jamaica that I did a Sunday night music show on Fame FM. So a lot of what I've been able to achieve in my adult life came from a passion that I had from, from my school days. And as I said, at that time, I didn't make the link that, you know, it could have been a career, but... It turned out that way because I didn't, I didn't study broadcasting and media. It's not something I studied. It was a gift that I had and I did an audition at RJR and that's why I got the job. It was while I was at RJR that I got a, a scholarship, Radio Jamaica um, acquired a scholarship for me through the British Council and I went to the BBC to study for like four months, radio production and broadcasting and so on. But I wasn't formally trained university-wise or otherwise. As, as a broadcaster. And as you would know, there are many, many successful broadcasters and media people in, in the Caribbean who never went the route of yeah. formally studying broadcasting. I don't want to suggest that, you know, you don't have to do it because <laughs> it helps. But, you know, if you take someone like Simon Crosskill, who has been one of the best um, commentators that the country has ever seen, Simon didn't study broadcasting at all. He didn't study media. He didn't do, uh, study journalism. He didn't do university to do these things. It's just a talent that he had. Yeah. So um, a lot of it comes from a passion, a desire. And when you get the job and when you begin functioning, you recognize that you're in a competitive world. So mm. when I was at Radio Jamaica, the, the radio landscape wasn't as wide as it is now with the proliferation of radio stations. It was just RJR and JBC. There was no IRA, there was no power, there was no KLS, nothing like that. So it was RJR against JBC. So you had to work hard. You had to study your information when you're going to do any broadcast at all. Make sure you have a lot of information to work with. And um, it is a lot of hard work. There are a lot of people who see us working on radio and television and they think it's an easy job. You just open up a mic and talk. <laughs> but it's a lot more than that. You have to work hard and you have to have information. People are depending on you for information. And when, when you talk, they feel that what you're saying is gospel. So you have to ensure that you have your facts, your information, and your research done. And those are some of the tenets that, that, that lead to success in the field. Yeah. With this uh, proliferation of, of, of media, houses, radio station, etc., do you think that that has watered down the quality in terms of the talent that we produce on air and in terms of what we get as a final content from the various media sources? I would have to say yes. Um, if I compare that to when I started out, there were... 
as I said, it was just JBC and RJR. Mm -hmm. And sports departments typically aren't huge departments because me media managers do not invest a lot in a sports team for the most part. Right. Um, I've seen clearly where a sports department in any media house becomes important when it's the Olympics or something major in sport is happening. But on an everyday basis, um, sports quite often is a second cousin to news and so on. So um, because of that, when I started, RJR sports team was just, was just three of us, myself, Ed Barnes, and yeah. Courtney Sargent. JBC had a few more, Linda Della Pena, Ali McNabb, and so on. And because they had television along with radio, they may have had maybe five or six people. So the, the, the opportunity for someone to get into sports broadcasting would have been very limited and the numbers being so small. So if you take into consideration what I just said, in the yeah. entire Jamaica, you would have space for probably four or five sports broadcasters in the entire country yeah. between JBC and RJR. And now we have a proliferation of radio stations, many of them with sports departments. So you may have 15 or 16 um, sports presenters now throughout the country or, or more. And by that very fact, you would see that the competition is not as great. So the, the, the standard or the, the, the standard by which you are measured begins to get a little diluted because there are more spaces. Um, that's not to say that there aren't talented people in the business now, but it was a lot harder to get into it when I started. And you had to be really, really good to get a spot at JBC or RJR because the spots were few and yeah. there were just two radio stations. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just say that I, I also wanted to get into this area. Um, I tried Caramac and, and, and they didn't take me twice. I tried. Uh, I guess that's why I went into podcasting and, <laughs> and, and, doubled, <laughs> and doubled in, in, yes. in some commentaries. Still, still not as good as you and Hubert and the rest. Yeah. Thanks. But, you know, as I said, I don't want to... I, I, I want to make the point that a lot of people underestimate what we do. That's so true. there are a lot of students who go into university and they go to study um, mass communication because they want to be in radio, they want to be in television. And I've seen many, many instances when the, the reality of what it entails hits them, they lose interest because first of all, it is a lot of hard work, a lot of long hours, you know, when I, start, when I started at Radio Jamaica in 1984, within two months of my start there, we had the Los Angeles Olympics coming up. Ed Barnes went to cover the Los Angeles Olympics, and I was there as sort of an anchor, as a new, a new, new kid on the block. I wasn't three months into my journalistic, my broadcasting career. In fact, I hadn't started broadcasting yet because I had to go through a training process where I recorded a, a, a newscast every day and Ed Barnes would assess my development and so on. So I wasn't immediately on air. So it was very, very difficult in the early stages to, to develop the confidence. But what I found out really early was that during those Olympic Games, I was going to work at five o'clock in the morning and leaving at almost midnight. And that was a, a, a rude awakening that this job, even though people see it as glamorous because you are on air and you, know, you begin to get known and people see you and you become a kind of a celebrity, it, 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 isn't, it, isn't, it isn't an easy job because those are pretty long hours. It's like 5 a.m. to 12 midnight and uh, the Olympics, as you know, is like 17, 18 days long, so including Saturdays and Sundays. So I was made aware very early that this wouldn't be an easy ride. There was a lot of hard work involved here. And a lot of people who, who aspire to become media practitioners underestimate the, 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 the volume of work and the long hours. Um, TV even more so than radio. It's like the film industry. You sit down and you watch a good movie and you see, you know, the acting and it's brilliant and all of that. And people don't realize some of the times you're, fil you're filming just one scene and it takes a day and a half without any sleep. 
<laughs> you know, I, that, 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 that is something that people quite often don't know until you know, they see a documentary on how the film was made and then they recognize that I know people envy the film, the actors, because yeah. they make so much money. But that's an, they, they earn it. There's a lot of hard work, a lot of, lot, and a lot of stress. I, I know I'm on the, the, the major games, especially the Olympics, but one of the things that you know, I observe is that media practitioners are, are even at the event after the last race, after the last event, because you have to be preparing scripts, um, production work, and worse if there are huge time differences. Yeah, well, as you would know, the, the, the Sydney Olympics in, in, in Australia would have been like 16 or 17 hours difference from Caribbean time. Beijing was like 13, 14 hours. Um, London wouldn't have been that bad. That's just like six, six hours or so. But very, 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 very difficult. And if you are in an, if you're in an environment like Sportsmax, which I am now, and we broadcast to the rest of the Caribbean. And as you just mentioned, you do uh, an entire broadcast of something. You have to stay back and shoot links because um, there may be a highlights package that you've got to prepare. The cricket uh, commentary people would, would know a lot about that too. So when a lot of the fans go through the turnstiles and make their way home, um, you know, reminiscing on the brilliant day they just saw, the, 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 the cameramen and the broadcasters are there doing links for some highlight show that has to come on in another three or four hours. And sometimes the stadium lights go out on us. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just mentioned uh, Sportsmax, and, and, and we're going to be talking about that. You, know, you, you are at Sportsmax. Uh, Sportsmax has changed the face of Caribbean sport media in, in, in so many different ways, uh, securing international Caribbean media sport content. Uh, tell us about how difficult or easy uh, that has been to achieve and, and just producing some of these content. Mm. Well, let me start by saying that I was encouraged to come back home in 2010 by Sportsmax because I had been in Barbados working with the Caribbean News Agency and the Caribbean Media Corporation for 15 years from 1995 to 2010. Mm -hmm. And it was because of the, the strides that Sportsmax was making as a, a television entity that convinced me that it was time to come back home and they had by the way just acquired the rights for the olympic games the 2012 london games right. and prior to that it was a company i worked with in barbados the caribbean media corporation that had the rights for the olympic games sydney 2000 um athens 2004 and beijing 2008 so um Oli mcintosh our ceo at sportsmax um was used that as a pivotal um, a, a pivotal um, convincing tool to say, listen, Lance, you're the Olympics man. And, and it's, we, we now have the Olympics, not the CMC <laughs> where you are. So that, that was part of the reason why it wasn't difficult for me to decide to come back to Sportsmax. But even since I've been back to Sportsmax at 20, in 2010 to now, um, a lot of strides made by Sportsmax. Um, the, 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 the wide range of content that we have uh, had during that period, you know, extends way beyond what it was then. At that point, it was pretty much Premier League football and some of the international West Indies cricket tours. But as you know, we now have the, the NBA, La Liga. Um, there were times when we had the Serie A as well and um, CPL cricket and um, a lot of content that we, not, we did not have like 10, 15 years ago. And we also invested in a, a, a broadcasting van, a broadcasting truck that allows us to cover domestic events on a huge scale, which is why schoolboy football, Red Stripe Premier League football, um, the Digicel Grand Prix track and field series, and so many of the local sporting events are being covered by Sportsmax. And it was through our broadcasting uh, abilities with HD quality broadcasting and so on that we were able to convince a lot of these content provide content owners that Sportsmax is the right place to broadcast for them and of course we we have had you know good presenters working uh, at Sportsmax over the years uh, Simon Crosskill came to Sportsmax about two years after I got there mm -hmm. um, George Davis is now with us as well and as we said, Hubert works with us freelance 
because he's not on staff at Sportsmax, but because of his track and field prowess, who have ensured that he has been a part of our, our track and field coverage. So Sportsmax has, from a Caribbean perspective, um, led the way in presenting sports coverage at a level never before seen, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. Yeah, and, and, and you also had Alexis Nunes, who had spent some yeah. time. Uh, yeah. she, she also speaks highly of you, by the way. She, she was on the pod. Yeah, she was. Uh, happy, happy that you mentioned Alexis, because Alexis is one of our success stories. We employed Alexis straight out of uh, mass come out of U- University of Western Mona. And um, I, I, will, I will give you a, a, a quick story about her employment because they, we had put something out, you know, asking for applications and auditions because we wanted a, a, a female presenter. And I think we got about maybe 10 or 15 and uh, a, a committee decided to, you know, shortlist to about three. And it was at that point that I entered the, the decision making because I didn't want to be going through too many things. I was pretty busy at the time. So I was called in to look at the, the three that were shortlisted. And um, I think, I, I think Alex was the, Alexis was the first one I looked at. And when I saw it, I said, I don't think I need to look at the other two, but let me, let, me, let me do that. And I looked at the other two and she was an immediate winner. She just had, she, she, the, the camera loved her. She was confident. Her, 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 her fluency was Im- impressive in my opinion. And um, we were very, very happy to employ Alexis Nunes. I think she was just about 20 years old at the time. Yeah, she had very, just, very left, young. just left university at the time. So probably 20, 21 yeah. the most. Right. And she grew rapidly over a short space of time. Um, when we started the Sports Max Zone show, she was one of the presenters on the show, along with my, myself, Wavel Hines and um, Joel Villafana from Trinidad and Tobago. Initially, we just had her reading the zone updates, the, the, the news part of the, right. of, the, of the zone show. But quickly, we thought she had developed the confidence and the sort of comfort on television to be a part of the set discussing sports. And um, we quickly brought her in there. And by then, Simon Croskill had come to do the Sports Max Zone. And she developed a very good relationship with Simon. In fact, they became buddies and uh, you never saw one without the other. And um, they fed off each other and yeah. Simon loved her and she loved Simon. And uh, we are really proud that we were able to develop her talent. Sad that she left us and went to the ESPN, but um, she's a young talent that we, we were proud to, to, to set the stage for. Yeah. Uh, Sportsmax is in, in that space with... Well, there was Flow Sports, but Flow Sports is, is struggling to be a be your competitor now. But certainly, you're you're competing with with other cable channels, with streaming sites, with YouTube Live, with Facebook Live, all of those. H- how do you create content that remain relevant and ensure that your viewers stick with with, with, with Sportsmax? Well, all of that has to go to our CEO, Ali McIntosh, who is a real expert at negotiating content and, and, and securing rights for the many things that you're watching on Sportsmax. Uh, admittedly, it's a very, very costly affair. I remember when I started working at Sportsmax in 2010, and um, cricket and English Premier League football at that time were our main, the things that we were best known for. And I remember in a management meeting, I think it could have been about 20. 12 or 2013, Ollie McIntosh announced in, in, in the meeting that, that morning that we had a serious problem because the, 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 the satellite transmission and the rights fee to broadcast cricket had increased like, I can't remember, but it, would, it had increased like 800%. It's like, you know, we were paying $100 for something and all of a sudden, it's $800. And this is like per hour for the day. And as you know, cricket isn't a two-hour thing. Yeah. We're talking <laughs> test cricket. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the span of commentary period would be from like 8.30 in the morning until 6. And it was an exponential increase in fees 
So we had to make a decision now whether we would still pursue rights for some of this cricket content. Mm -hmm. And it was a period that was very difficult for us because we did at one point have to not pursue certain cricket content because the cost was just beyond affordable for us. And uh, that was sad for us because there are a lot of our viewers who are huge cricket fans. And I know, you know, the advent of T20 cricket and the 50 over game being shorter uh, have been exciting, you know, products for television fans. But there are people who still really enjoy test cricket and it became very expensive. So our cricket content has kind of taken a blow to a certain extent because of the high cost Mm -hmm. and the long hours of broadcast, which you know, multiplies the cost significantly. But um, we have some very astute managers at Sportsmax and they've gone for other content. And the NBA is something that we now boast as one of the, well, the, the exclusive, exclusive from a Caribbean perspective uh, broadcasters of, of the NBA. And you know how big the NBA is. So yeah. <laughs> along with the NBA and um, uh, La Liga and, uh, you know, the, the cricket that we show now, um, Sportsmax has been able to maintain a very, very prominent space in the in the broadcast world from from the Caribbean and our statistics, the the viewer statistics, um, put us very favorably, you know, with the likes of ESPN and so mm-hmm. on for for Caribbean viewers, which we are very proud of. This may be a tough one for you. Uh, no, well, no question is tough for you, Lance. The, the the pandemic has been you know something that none of us expected and i'm sure it's a huge hit for for broadcasting and media houses in in the caribbean more probably more than anywhere else how do you see sportsmax and certainly you recovering from this in terms of uh engaging the viewers and also creating content that will still capture imagination over over a period of time mm. Well, the good thing for us is that a lot of the, the content has been resuscitated. You know, La Liga is back up and so on, and the NBA is going to be starting at the end of July, we hope. So um, in the immediate future, we're seeing a rebirth of some of these yeah. things. But to address the point that you're making, which is a significant point, we have gone to our three months with meetings upon meetings upon meetings, um, thinking out of the box, brainstorming about making sure that our channel remains something that people want to watch because no one wants to sit down and just watch replays and reruns of things that they'd seen before. I think initially, because everyone recognized that the COVID-19 problem was unforeseen and Mm -hmm took everyone, you know, off guard. I think for the most part, viewers were a little bit patient initially with um, the difficulties that we were facing. But you know what? We thought that there were some big things that have happened in the past that people wouldn't mind seeing again. And uh, things like the World Series cricket when the West Indies were battling the Australians and so on with the Malcolm Marshalls, Michael Holdings, Andy Robertses, Viv Richards of this world. That is, we were thinking of, of bringing events like those back where people wouldn't mind reliving some of those moments. We know that West Indies cricket today is a shadow of what it was then. So to bring back some of those West Indies cricket moments would have been something that our viewers would appreciate. Um, from uh, a boxing standpoint, we were able to... Um, acquire the, the showing rights of some very, very massive boxing events in the past. Muhammad Ali, um, yeah. who died four years ago, is widely regarded as the greatest sports figure of all time. And we were able to have reruns with his triple uh, classic with Joe Fraser, ending with a thriller in Manila. Mm-hmm. And um, I think boxing fans enjoyed that. So the fact that there was no live sport to see I think our viewers recognize that we, we, we couldn't turn water into wine. We, if there aren't any live sports happening, <laughs> there's no way we can show you. Yeah. So I, I think we did our best to ensure that we could put things on the table that would, would, would engage our viewers. On our Sports Max Zone show, one of the things we created was the Ultimate 11. We, mm-hmm. we ran a series, Ultimate 11, for our 
panel of experts or zone hosts and our online viewers to pick the ultimate 11, the best football team of all time, the best cricket test team of all time, the best cricket T20 team of all time, o ODI team of all time. And this um, captured the, the interest of our Sports Max Zone viewers, viewers for weeks upon weeks upon weeks. So we had to do things during the period of the COVID-19 shutdown of sport that ensure that we, we were able to present things on air that the viewer would find attractive. And um, uh, one of the things that didn't suffer that much from the COVID-19 shutdown was horse racing. There wasn't any horse racing in the Caribbean for three months, but there had been racing going on. Uh, England horse racing had been yeah. resuscitated. So as soon as that got going, we were able to show that. And before the COVID-19 had fully taken effect, Caymanus Park Horse Racing in Jamaica had, had gone on for about two weeks after everything else was shut down. So we used that opportunity because La Liga and all of the regular content had gone for two consecutive race days. We had live Caymanus Park Horse Racing on Sportsmax um, the entire afternoon from midday straight to six o'clock. So it was an opportunity to show Caymanus Park Horse Racing that we didn't have before because we had so much content throughout the afternoons that we couldn't fit Caymanus Park Horse Racing into it. So it's been a very, very difficult period, but we are seeing where uh, a lot of the restrictions are, are being lifted. Mm -hmm. um, many, many sports are coming back. So the, the period of real, the real dearth of live sporting content, we hope, is behind us now. Yeah, um, I, as you mentioned, you know, some of those content I too, uh, I've been watching, I had to watch the boxing and I'm no longer a huge boxing fan these days as I used to be. Same thing for cricket. So it was really good kind of just catching up with those. And, and the worst part is that we had nothing else to watch, to be honest with you. So, so, so we're patient, we're tolerant of um, yes. A lot of that content that we, you know, we haven't seen in a while, watching Biff Richards again and all of those guys. Because Ad admittedly, admittedly, it wasn't HD quality. Uh, <laughs> no. we're, we're, you know, and Listen. I think we've been spoiled. We've been spoiled by the HD quality that we, we are now we can now see. So sometimes you watch those old videos and it, it takes a little bit away because I, the, the, the pictures aren't so sharp. I am going to be honest with you. At that point, we really don't care whether it's HD or not. We just, we just want to watch some sport. So, 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 so we appreciate, well, certainly I was appreciative of, of that. Um, Thanks. And, I, and I know it must be some challenging times for, for not just yourself, but media houses across the Caribbean, free to air, etc. cetera. Um, must, must be really, really challenging, you know, and I, I wish you guys all the best in, in terms of the recovery. Uh, 2020 Olympics is now, well, will be in 2021. It still will be 2020, Tokyo 2020. Um, well, we hope, we hope. Oh, gee, well, that, that's the other part. We're, we're really hoping. Um, what are some of the, the changes that you're hoping to improve? kind of just put in place uh, how has that been going for you and the team because i can well imagine the disappointment in the postponement but recognizing that i guess it had to be done yeah well because we had just one experience of covering the olympic games sports max back in london 2012 our efforts have been fully trained on ensuring that our product would be far superior to what we delivered in 2012 and far superior to what the Caribbean got in 2016 yeah. from the partnership between ESPN and, and Flo um, for the Rio uh, 2016 Olympic Games. So we were busy putting things in place to ensure that we would be sending a, a bigger team, a bigger team, so straight manpower than we had in, in, in London 2012 when we had our first and only attempt at the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the emphasis, Dalton, was being placed on the, 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 the build-up, the pre-Olympic period in the months leading up to the Olympics. A lot of features, documentaries, and interviews with all of our Caribbean stars getting themselves ready for the Olympic Games. Because I know when the two and a half weeks of the Olympics comes up, everyone, people take vacation to watch yeah. the Olympic Games. But we feel as a, a top flight sports television entity, it is our duty to ensure that people 
recognize what goes into preparing the athletes for the Olympic Games. So months ahead of the Olympic Games, we would have been going to Trinidad and Tobago to do you know, features with Kishon Walcott, who we remember as a 19-year-old mm-hmm. who won the, the javelin in, in London, some of their top cyclists, just saying Philip and so on. And going through scouting the region for some of the key athletes and how they were preparing. So a lot of our work for coverage of the Olympic Games actually comes a long period before the Olympics actually come up because you, you have to ensure that you, you've done your research and you've got a lot of, of video content of uh, the athletes who will be performing yeah. at the Olympic Games to ensure that when an athlete is going to perform, let's say, on day two of the Olympic Games, on the morning you have a documentary there of just how the last two or three months of that athlete's preparation had been. So it brings you as a viewer watching the Olympic Games coverage now a lot closer to the athlete and what that athlete would have done in preparation to get there. So uh, a lot of the improvement that you would have seen wouldn't necessarily come only by way of the coverage of the event itself, but the supplementary um, work that is done to... Mm -hmm. To you know, to enhance the the, the the product itself, and and would it be difficult now to maintain that? Seeing that we, you know, we, some of those athletes may or may not qualify for, or may not be able to attend the next games because if you're qualified now, you you're, you're still qualified for 2021. Um, how do you maintain that? How do you maintain that energy with the team uh, to keep it going until next year, knowing that we may not have the Olympics next year? Well. That is one of the hazards of our job, Dalton. Um, we always recognize in our business, you will hear it all the time, that you're, you're only as good as your last, your, your last assignment. So we recognize that although people were, were very complimentary of what we did in 2012 and complimentary of what we do on a daily basis at, at Sportsmax, um, all, of that, all of those accolades can be wiped away if you aren't able to reproduce it. So mm-hmm. this is one of the challenges that we as producers and presenters face, that every time we have an assignment, we have to ensure that we put in 100%, we deliver the best product we possibly can, because um, reputation in the media is something that just carries you to a certain level and no further. A, a reputation can be wiped away mm-hmm. if it is that you aren't able to sustain it. And um, that is one of, the, one of the things that would propel a, a, a broadcasting unit to ensure that when they go out next week to work on a project, it yeah. is as yeah. good as or better even than the one you did the week before or two or three weeks prior to that. Yeah. Lance, I, I didn't even send this to you before, but some, I thought I'd get your views on, on, on three things if you don't mind. Uh, mm-hmm. how, how do you see the future of track and field in Jamaica and certainly the rest of the Caribbean? I guess the backdrop that some people say that, you know, Jamaican track and field is, is at a space where it's concerning for some people, comparative to, say, 2008. Um, because of the retirement of Usain Bolt, there are a lot of... Uh, Jamaican track and field fans now who are very concerned about the immediate future of uh, track and field. But to be quite honest, more from the men's standpoint, because of, because of what Asafa Paul and Usain Bolt and Johan Blake have delivered for Jamaican fans for almost 20 years now, Jamaicans expect that when a major championship, world championship, Olympic Games, a 100-meter men's final or 200-meter final is going to mm-hmm. be contested, <laughs> they expect to see a Jamaican there. Yeah. A bit sexist, that view, because when people talk about the decline of Jamaican track and field, in essence, they must be talking about the men's performances, because to be quite honest, the women are firing and yeah. firing on all cylinders. So and I've always to be been. Fair, <laughs> yes, to be fair, the women are keeping the flag up. But you know, a lot of things in life, Dalton, are cyclical, and we cannot expect that over a period of time, over generations, over decades, you are going to be blessed with the same talent 
continuously. There are going to be troughs and waves. And I think um, we may experience that a bit on the men's side, but a lot has to be, a lot has to be um, said to about our field events performances or, or throwers or, or jumpers. <laughs> you know, when, when, you, when you look at what we've been able to do outside of track, for the last five or six years, mind-boggling, mind-boggling. And um, I think that the future of Jamaican track and field is, is, is very solid. I yeah. think the main worry for most people is that there isn't a Usain boat that they're looking <laughs> yeah. at right now. And it, it sort of hurts because boat spoils us all. Yeah. But um, he is phenomenal. You know, Usain Bolt isn't a normal athlete. And we have to recognize that this was a gift that Jamaica received from a man that has achieved things that we aren't sure when we'll ever see it again. Yeah, if, if, you really, if you really assess what Usain Bolt has been to men sprinting Dalton, he enters the conversation of being the greatest athlete of all time, spanning any sport because of the dominance, because of the world records he has, which are significantly... Um, more, more, more impressive than his closest rivals. So, so Bolt, Bolt is, is, is a phenomenal athlete that I don't think we should allow ourselves to be spoiled by the fact that there is not another Bolt on the horizon now. Mm. But the women are doing well or field events competitors are doing well. There are some men who, in the sprinting, division who, you know, if they, if they continue to perform injury free and so on, uh, you know, will be able to resuscitate some level of um, potency for Jamaican sprinting um, if all goes well. So I don't think all is lost there, but coming from a boat, everything else will seem to be struggling. <laughs> Speaking about track, what of a different kind? So horse racing is, is really considered uh, the sport of kings. Uh, a, a lot of young people are, are not really gravitating towards it in the Caribbean. And the industry has struggled, certainly, throughout the Caribbean. What are some of the challenges you see and, and how can we improve in, in that sport? Boy, Dalton, that's a tough one, you know, because horse racing is a sport that struggles globally. In fact, um, a lot of Jamaican and Caribbean horse racing is patterned off racing in, in North America as opposed to racing like in Europe and so on. And um, many of the successful horse racing tracks in the USA have with them casinos, it, the, the, the complex is a horse racing and a casino facility. I've known racetracks in Canada and the USA to close down because the casino closed down. So horse racing needs huge injection of capital to really flourish. Supreme Ventures, as you know, um, won the bid to become the new promoters of horse racing a few years ago. And because of their business, they spin a lot of capital. But horse racing by itself is a very, very expensive sport. I know Supreme Ventures Racing and Entertainment Limited, Solomon Sharp, their current chairman, and um, the, the, the group there, Lorna Gooden, who is the general manager and so on, they, are, they have a lot of plans to bring horse racing to a level that it will start to flourish again. But it's very, very tough. The complex, it, complex itself needs a lot of renovation. The stables are not in, not in a good way, but they have got to work at things incrementally. But horse racing is a sport that employs a lot of people, which is one of the reasons why it has been the first sport that has come back on the, mm -hmm. on the landscape from a Jamaican standpoint, because there is a recognition that it's, it's, it, it, it employs a lot of people. And I think go the government recognizes this and um, I don't know exactly what the answers are to bring horse racing <laughs> yeah. to the level that it, that it can, but um, they, have a, they need a huge injection of capital, first of all, to refurbish the complex, to make like the stable areas and so on a lot cleaner and a lot, a lot, more, um, lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. But it's a wonderful sport, horse racing. It's, it's one of my favorite sports, and um, I'd, I'd, like to see it, I'd like to see it get back to a level that everyone involved can be proud of. 
Uh, something we are not proud of now is the win-loss record for West Indies cricket. So I'll, I'll touch that one now. And probably if you have the answers, you'll become the next president of <laughs> cricket <laughs> West Indies or West Indies cricket world. I'm not even too sure what the name is these days. But th that has struggled, Lance. I mean, certainly I'm an 80s baby watching West Indies cricket team dominating until uh, early 90s, certainly Australia um, defeating us. What, what are some of the recommendations? How, how can we get back to even half of where we used to be uh, so that even young people will want to watch the sport? Well, there are a couple of things that triggered the, the collapse of West Indies cricket, and we have to call it that, because given where we are now, it has been a collapse. Oh, life we support. Were, yeah, we, we, we were the best in the world. In fact, um, statistics had... had supported a view that at its peak, the West Indies team was the greatest sports team of its time, all sport considered. Mm -hmm. Now, a few things have happened in the last three decades or so. One, a lot of other countries, India, Australia, England, and so on, invested significantly more in cricket than the West Indies did. They, they have bigger resources and they were able to set up academies and they were able to, you know, improve their, their pitches, their facilities, their training equipment and so on. So the West Indies got left behind. So that was a part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that the average youngster in the Caribbean now doesn't see cricket as something that they aspire to, which was the complete opposite in the 1950s and the 1960s. I was born in the 60s, but I dare say youngsters born in the 50s wanted to be George Headley, yeah. you know, wanted to be a Don Bradman. People born in the 60s wanted to be Sir Garfield Sobers. People born in the 70s wanted to be Ivia Richards, Michael Holding, Andrew Roberts. And uh, we have seen the sporting landscape transitioned to a level where the average youngster in the Caribbean right now, if they are interested in sport any at all, cricket is not their number one. <laughs> and it used to be. Yeah. It used to be. When I was growing up in, in the 70s, we played a lot of cricket on the streets. We played cricket a lot. There was as much cricket on my street as there was football. If you can tell me the last time you saw some youngsters playing cricket wherever you are, <laughs> you, you, you can let me know. But cricket is, yeah. cricket is not attractive. So I remember the Honorable Pat Russo, who was chairman of Sportsmax, when I, when I, I went to Sportsmax, he had started the kiddies cricket, the, the under-15 cricket program, mm -hmm. which sort of resuscitated some interest in the sport at the teenage level for, for a period of time. But one of the biggest problems we face now in getting cricket back to where it was, Dalton, is trying to get youngsters interested in the sport. Because if young people, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, aren't gravitating towards cricket as a sport, the result is going to be clear. Yeah. The numbers playing the sport will significantly decrease. And because of the critical mass, which is now non-existent, the, the, the possibility or the likelihood of, of producing stars and numerous stars will significantly, will significantly decrease. So successive um, Cricket West Indies, previous to West Indies Cricket Board presidents and administrators, spoken ad nauseum about regenerating schools cricket and developing you know interest in in schools and youngsters but that hasn't been happening and i, I can yeah. tell you cricket isn't 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 even a quarter in my opinion as popular now as it was in the 70s and there is there is a huge part of the problem because if yeah. you don't have youngsters gravitating toward the sport in the way that they are now to like basketball and, and football, then it's going to be very, very difficult 
for the region to produce cricketers in a prolific manner to make us competitive on the world scene. So there has, they, 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 they have to find a way to get youngsters interested in cricket again. We have to in, improve our facilities. Our, our, our West Indies cricketers will tell you that when they go on tour and they go to like practice facilities in South Africa and you know, Australia and so on, it is like miles, miles ahead of what we have here in the Caribbean. So we are, yeah. not, we are, we are not setting ourselves up with the material to allow our cricket to grow. I will concede that from a financial standpoint, we are at a disadvantage because countries like England, Australia, India, and so on have a lot more resources to pump into the, into the game. But there is talent. There is talent in West Indies cricket. I, I can tell you this current crop, there is, there, there is talent there. I, I think Shea Hope technically is a very, very classy batsman. Um, Shimron Hetmar has as many shots as Roy Fredericks had in the 1970s. Um, but I think that the talent that we're seeing now coming through is the numbers aren't great. They, yeah. they are there, yeah. but the numbers aren't great. And one of the reasons why the West Indies had become dominant is because the numbers were great in talent. You would know, Dalton, that there yeah. were people who could not make the West Indies team <laughs> in the 70s and 80s if they were living somewhere else they would walk into an Australia team or an Indian yeah, team or so on. So it is the numbers that, that's beating us. But I think there is enough talent in this present squad that if the players develop at, 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 a, at a normal level, because a lot of our players get better with time. What we have seen in West Indies cricket is that we have seen players slide. We've seen players who come in as youngsters early in their international careers, appear to have a little promise. And within two to three years, they seem to, to go backwards. You remember Adrian Barr? Yep, Adrian yep. Barr, as a 19-year-old, turned 20, scored 100 in his first series against Australia. Yep. Australia. No, he, he's, I don't think he's 30 years old yet, or maybe just about. And he isn't playing cricket anymore. So we've had instances of players who have talent, but... West Indies cricket as it now stands is delinquent in harnessing what we have and turning it into a world-beating machine, which is what we were able to do in the 70s and 80s. Mm. Interesting. Lance, I couldn't let you leave without asking you this one. Um, we've had generation of very good journalists, great journalists, uh, commentators, yourself included, Lance, Ed Barnes, Lindy De La Pena, uh, just to name a few. And, and we've had multidisciplinary journalists, I call it, in Rowan Daly, yourself again. Uh, what advice do you have for young journalists, youngsters who want to get into this space, since we may just be having a, a, a gap here again in terms of having the numbers in terms of quality sports journalists? Well, in the media, I find that the most successful people in media, Dalton, are people with a passion for the job. You know, not, not, not so much qualifications, although that is important, but a passion for the job. Our job requires a lot of passion. Our, our job requires long hours, detailed work, thorough research. And you're not going to do these things comfortably if you don't have the passion for it. My first boss, Ed Barnes, when he talks to people about seeing me grow in the business, that is the word I hear him use most, that Lance had the passion. There were, there were other people who you know, may have had the ability and so on, but Lance had the passion. So I think that, that's, the, that's, that's the watch word that I would use, yeah. passion. Now, after you have the passion, you have to have the, the appetite for hard work because our job isn't, isn't easy. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. And in many instances, families suffer, marriages break up because you are dedicating too much of your time to, <laughs> to, to your job and so on. But it's a part of what makes you succeed. And um, hard work, passion, research. Because in our business, information accurate information 
vital information and um, information that isn't readily available. These are the things that will set you apart from other people. And uh, throughout my career, especially in the early stages when I was, was trying to, to establish myself as a solid broadcaster, I tried to do things that I, I, I didn't see others do. So that when I, when I spoke, when I said something on air, I would, I would have the comfort of knowing that not many others are saying this. So it sets you apart. So that is another thing that I would advise, you know, budding commentators to, to, to do. Aim for, for, for some level of uniqueness in, in what you're presenting so that people can expect and, and look to you for that. Because our business is very competitive. When I train young journalists, I explain to them that if you go to cover a sporting event, let's say you go to the stadium and, and you watch Usain Bolt run a world record, there are 10 journalists there covering <laughs> the same event, television, radio, the various newspapers, and so on. So you, 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 you all have the same story working with. It's the journalist who tells the best story that gets the rating because you have to, you have to employ your skills in delivering the story in a way that sets you apart from someone else. You know, if you're, if you're a print journalist, the words you use to describe Usain Bolt's win, the, the intricacies that you are able to to, to, to bring to life in your, in your report. Are, those are the things that will set you apart from your, your rivals. Because as I said, you're covering the same event. Yeah. So it's, it's, who, it's who tells, the best, who tells <laughs> the best story. And you stay away from the cliche words, the words that everyone else will use. And you find your own words. So you, you, you build your name based on the things you say. I, I you know, even, even now... You know, people see me on the street and they, they say, Lance, big engine boat. That's when I was <laughs> but they had never heard that before. Usain Bolt turns on the big engine. So that was something I'd, I'd never heard anyone say before. And you, you, you find ways to describe things that, that aren't run of the mill. You know, so um, those are the things that set you apart. You have to work hard. You have to have the passion and you have to find a way to do things different, stroke better than your comp your your competition. Uh, listen, um, those are some really good advice, uh, Lance, and I and I appreciate it. And also appreciate that you you took some time out. Uh, I know I know you're a very busy man, uh, so I I really appreciate it. So thank you very much for for joining us. Yeah, Dalton, it was a pleasure, man. I, re I really appreciate it. Guys, you can follow Lance. Uh, he's at SportsMax Lance on, on Twitter and Lance Whitaker on Facebook. Uh, you probably see him trying to play football there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that's one of his passion again. You know, he'll probably tell you that he's a, he's a big football and Jamaican pro Lance. But on behalf of producer Rashika Grant um, and the entire production team, uh, Marsha Boyce, uh, everyone there, thanks for joining us uh, on this episode of The Drive Phase. Remember, guys, to check out our website. Uh, it's at thedrivephase.com. Uh, make sure you subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or whichever directory uh, that you use for all your podcasts. And we're going to be on YouTube also. Uh, we put those in the show notes. Uh, so you can go and tell a friend about the show so they too can spread the word about the show. Remember, we appreciate ratings on any one of the podcast directories that you use. And you can send us feedback on the at the drive phase at gmail.com that's our email address so until next time see you then